Happy moving slow. <laughs> Thank you, choir, musicians. Thank you for being here. God bless you. I appreciate you being here. I wrestled a little bit over what to call this sermon. Uh, we started out this kind of, I didn't have, have any idea when we started it'd be a series, but kind of a series on the end times, but I didn't intend to do that, but God did, so here we are. The first one I started at is the beginning of the end. Today I started to call this one the beginning of sorrows. Uh, Jesus, to me, obviously the greatest teacher that ever walked on the face of the earth. No doubt about it. But he was also the greatest prophet on the face of the earth. So I entitled it, What's Ahead? And who knows? Well, I know who knows. And you do too, if you think about it for a minute. This old world's tried hard to figure out what the world holds and uh, we've tried for centuries to find somebody that could tell us, you know, what's, what's going on and what tomorrow's going to be. Oh, we've got all kind of soothsayers and lies and liars all over the place today trying to tell us such things as that. But I can tell you one thing for certain that I know today. I know that there's one book, and only one book. You can read all the books on the, on the end times. Uh, David was talking about big words, but on eschatology, all right? If you ever hear one of them big-time pastors, preachers, talking about eschatology, it means the end times. But you can read all kind of books on the end times, and you can read them and, and think you know something. But really, the only book that is proven for centuries that has never had one single thing proven wrong, and that is the Word of God. Every prophecy that the Bible has ever revealed has always come true right down to the letter. And I believe with all my heart that we do live in a time in our lives that's unprecedented. I think we're living in a time when uh, the unfolding of the final prophecies of God is before us. And in our, in, our, in our very eyes to view, if we choose to do so with a heart of faith. I know, I know a lot of things, but there's a whole lot more that I don't know. So what I'm going to talk about today is what Jesus said, because he's the one who knew it all. So we're going to go, as the old saying goes, to the horse's mouth, and we're going to hear what Jesus had to say about end-time prophecies. And if we talk about the beginning of the end, you understand something from me very, very clearly before we start. I'm not trying to tell you when Christ is going to come again or when the end is going to come. I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says, and you deal with it any way you see fit, all right? That's what this morning is all about. Let's read our text now from the book of Matthew, chapter 24. Great story. You've heard it many times before. Matthew, chapter 24. And we'll start reading in verse 1, verse 1 through 14, where we see Jesus and the disciples. And you always, always tell you now, what did it mean when it was written? Matthew wrote down, to the best of his ability, what actually transpired on that day. So when you start reading in Matthew, chapter 24, I want to kind of set the scene for you because the disciples wanted Jesus to see this grand, beautiful temple that had been built in Jerusalem. They were in Jerusalem. They were close by to it, and, and they just wanted, boy, they were like any good Jew. 
They were proud of what the Jews had accomplished and what they had done in the building of this grandest building on the earth in its time. All right? And so Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. That means that Jesus had been in the worship area, sanctuary we call it, and they had, had gone through the worship service, and then now he has gone out. He's headed out the door, and the disciples says, wait a minute, Jesus, we want you to see the rest of it. Man, this thing is gorgeous. It's beautiful. And Jesus just kind of stopped, and I can imagine in my mind, Jesus might have turned and sort of looked a little baby over his shoulders, maybe turned to look at the front of the building. And Jesus just simply said to them in verse 2, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginnings of sorrow. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Let's pray. Your will and your way and anything I say in Christ's name. Amen. The disciples were proud of that temple. All the Jews were. It was absolutely gorgeous. It was grand and glorious. And it stood up there as a testimony to the greatness of the Israeli nation. They were so proud of it that they wanted everybody to see it. And of course, they wanted Jesus to see it because he was their leader. He was their rabbi. And so they wanted to make sure that Jesus didn't miss a thing. I want you, we want you to see every inch, every crack and crevice, every corner. We want you to see this grand thing that has been done unto God or for God. And in verse 2, Jesus could have said anything else. Hey, oh, how beautiful this place is. How grand it is. What a great job y'all have done. How super be the great nation of Israel. But Jesus looked at it all in one scoping view of his eyes. And what did he say? Can you really see all these things? Let me show you something. I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Was that an insult? Well, they might have taken it that way to begin with. Jesus, I don't think, really meant it. I don't think Jesus intended to hurt their feelings or, <coughs> or to say something that might make them feel bad. He could have said anything else, but Jesus was not that kind. Jesus was the kind that was going to tell it like it is, and he did. He told them straight up and straightforward. What is he trying to tell them? First of all, and you'll find that as we go through the Scripture, don't put your faith and trust in a building, boys. That building is not going to last. It's not going to be here in days yet ahead. I remember David and I one time, I think Jeff and Linda might have been with us, we went up to the mountains and stayed in this beautiful cabin up on the side of a mountain, and man, it was gorgeous. Maybe and I was talking about the other night, the, the front end was just glass, you know, all the A-frame. You know how they build them. Well, that thing was pretty. We sat out on the deck and we looked and we sat in the living room and you could see the mountains. And we were so impressed. We went back a few years later and it was just standing there almost falling in, rotting them down. You know, that's life. But that wasn't what Jesus was predicting. He wasn't predicting that this building is going to get old and decrepit and fall apart. He was not saying that this building is going to stand until it gets old and falls down. Jesus was giving them a prophecy to help them. Because Jesus knew that just in a few short years, 
that Titus was going to lead the Romans on a destructive rampage. They were going to come into Jerusalem and they were going to destroy everything precious. They didn't know that. But Jesus wanted them to know that. Why? So that they could be prepared. There you go. Therein is why I believe God is leading some of us in this day and time to help you to be prepared, to know the things that are ahead so that, number one, you won't be troubled. Remember when we started out with the Second Thessalonians and Paul said, come rest with us? You know, understand, these things are coming. We cannot stop them. We cannot speed them up. But they're coming, and yet God is in control. And Jesus wanted these disciples to know that because he knew that he was going to be going into heaven. And so he wanted them to know that this is something that's going to happen. I don't want you to be destroyed when the temple is destroyed. Now, the disciples would have known, just as Jesus did, that when the Romans went into a city and conquered that city, they never destroyed the temples or the worship places in those cities because the Romans had found out that it's easier to control the people if you let them continue to practice or exercise their religion. If you don't try to change their religion by destroying it, it makes them mad, tears them up, and they're just ready to kill everybody and anything. But specifically, you know that temple in Jerusalem was the center place of the earth for the Jewish worship. I mean, that temple was that important to them. And so, because of that, the Caesar had said, do not, whatever you do, for sure, don't destroy that temple. And yet Jesus said it's going to be destroyed right shortly. What Jesus knew, they didn't know. When Jesus said there won't be one stone left upon another, what did he mean? He meant not just that it would fall in, not that they would just tear it down or that it would burn up, but Jesus meant there wouldn't be anything left of it. Well, that made no sense to those disciples for sure. But yet they saw it. They saw what happened. Jesus said it will be total, absolute annihilation of this temple. But we know when Titus led the armies into Jerusalem, something happened. It wasn't intentionally set on fire. Maybe a flaming arrow from one of the wayward sons that shot over in that direction. Caught it. We don't know, but we do know one thing. We do know that those huge cedars of Lebanon that held that thing up and were so gorgeous and beautiful and grand did catch on fire. And they did burn like pine kindling until the thing collapsed in on itself. And you say, okay, so it burned. And so it fell in on itself. That don't mean that it's totally annihilated because all the stones and the rubble and all of that's just fell in and it's burned and it's sitting there smoking. But what everybody knew, because they had seen it so beautifully, the crown mold in that, in that beautiful temple was made of solid gold. What happens when gold gets hot? It melts. It runs. It gets in the cracks and the crevices of all of those stones. Also in there was all of those ornate and beautiful golden vessels that was used for worship in the temple. And there they were in that pile somewhere that somebody could get hold of them. I mean, they were distorted and melted and not looking, but they were still solid gold. And so people began to come. They began to come from everywhere. The thieves came. Even the Roman soldiers, Josephus, the, uh, the, uh, the, the newspaper man of the day, wrote a great article about how the, even the Roman soldiers were prizing those stones apart and scraping out the gold from in between them. They even took the stones into other parts of the country and built buildings out of them. Little did they care. I mean, it's no good anymore. They even and I visited the Wailing Wall, which is really all that's left. It's nothing more than a retainer wall, kind of like what we got back here to hold that, that uh, bank off of our driveway. A retainer wall that stands there that was holding up the ground on one side had nothing really to do with the temple other than just holding the ground. That's all that's left there. You can go and see the Wailing Wall. People visit it all the time, Jews especially, consider it to be sacred. But of the temple itself, there's not one stone left there on that site as a memorial of where that, that grand temple once stood. That made no sense. When Jesus told the disciples about that, 
It made no sense to them at all. That was silly. In verse 3, it says they went on over to the Mount of Olives. They're sitting on the Mount of Olives. Imagine the scene they could see because over here, the Mount of Olives, the Sanhedrin, I mean the, uh, the uh, Kidron Valley is between. And then over here is the old. And that's where the temple would have sat. And so later, if Jesus and his disciples sat up there on the Mount of Olives, kind of looking, they would have seen that grand scene of that temple sitting over there. <clears throat> and they were thinking, Jesus, when is this going to happen? Jesus didn't tell them it's going to happen about 40 years from now when it did. But he just began to tell them of some things that he thought they needed to know. And I think he was telling not just them, but he was telling us today. Here, I want you to know some things. There's a few things I want you to know. First of all, Jesus said, the disciples that asked him, when is that going to happen? When's the temple destruction going to be? But also, when, when are you going to come back and set up your kingdom on this earth? When are you going to return? And when is the end times going to happen? And Jesus began to speak. I can imagine kind of quietly, softly, because he knew how the disturbed the disciples were. He was trying to be gentle with them. I'm sure he said, now look, first of all, guys, don't let any man deceive you. Don't let any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear wars and rumors of wars. Did you be not troubled? For all these things must come to pass. But listen to what he said. But the eon, the end, is not yet. What is that? That word eon doesn't mean the world, the earth, the physical thing. It means the end of the age. The end of the age. The end of the of civilization as we know it. The end of things as man had gotten used to. He's saying there's going to come that time. And so I say to you this morning, as I said to me when I was preparing all of this, get ready. Get ready. Because Jesus is about to tell you what's going to happen. He's going to tell you things that should calm your nerves, help you settle down, should also tell you that, look, I am in control. I know what's going to happen. I know what's happening now. I know what's going to happen. Verse 4, he said, there's going to come this deception. These, these people are going to start to, to preach contrary things to the Word of God. Now, does it matter that they preach it out there on the streets or out in the world? Well, yes, it matters. But not as much so as what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was saying there's going to be people who are going to be here intentionally trying to deceive the saints of God. Believers in Christ, Christians, Christians. He says, we're going to come. They're going to come and they're going to try to deceive you. In verse 24, the Bible says, there's going to be many deceivers. For there shall arise false Christ. That means lying preachers. False prophets. And shall show great signs and wonders so much that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. That when the time is coming toward, as we get closer and closer to the end of civilization, to the end of man as we know it, when we get closer and closer to the next coming of Jesus to this earth to set up his kingdom, as we get closer to it, there are going to be so many that are going to be wanting to get into the churches, into the places of worship, into the families of God that are worshiping and try to deceive you. That's why Jesus was telling those disciples, but he's also telling you disciples, be careful and don't be deceived. How do you be careful? You study these things to make sure they are so. You study God's word to see that the things that you're being taught, the people that are doing and saying, that you know they are of God. Don't be deceived by miracles. Don't be deceived because somebody comes strutting down that aisle and he touches somebody and they fall out on the floor and boy, they flopping like a struck possum? Jesus is saying many is going to come doing junk like that and they're going to try to deceive you. They're going to try to get you to believe that they are something special. What's that all about? It's about bringing glory to themselves. The Bible teaches you from cover to cover from the very book of Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation. All glory belongs to God. That's the reason Satan was cast out of heaven because he wanted God's glory for himself. And God said, oh, no, big boy, you can just get out of here. I'm not having you around because you're trying to do something that is going to take my glory away. God deserves it, and God alone 
Do not be deceived by people who want to elevate themselves rather than elevating God. Believe in Christ alone. That's what he's telling you and me today. Yeah, it meant that to those disciples, certainly. They were those who were in that day doing the same thing. But today it is so rampant, so rampant of men and women who want to stand in pulpits and stand in places of worship and get on the TV and everywhere else and try to get you to glorify them, to make them something that they're not, some kind of deity, some kind of something. Can I tell you something? I want you to hear this. Please, get hold of it. I stand here today to preach God's word because he called me to do it. But I am no greater, no closer to God, no more worthy of glory than any of you are. Only God is worthy of glory, not me, not some human being. Jesus said, don't pay those charlatans any attention. Leave them alone. Get away from them. If they are glorifying themselves, exit stage right. Jesus is trying to get us to understand what he means when he says all glory is for him and for the Father. He deserves it. It's his. It's where it should be. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. John said in his old age, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they're of God, because many false prophets are gone out into this world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And he goes on to explain further. He doesn't mean everybody that says Lord, Lord is of God. He means that the true man of God, the true woman of God, the true Christian is going to know that the glory is God's, not mine. Please don't do me that way. Jesus said, don't do another human being that way. Do not follow any man. Jesus Christ is worthy of of our praise, not human being. I have heard people all of my years in the pastorate, oh boy, so and so, you just don't know, man, he's great. Well, wonderful if he's great. But don't follow him. Don't follow me. Follow Christ. Christ is the one who deserves the glory. So, so many people today are deceived by the little tricks and the little tales. And the little glamour and the glorious looking things that, that men and women do that lead lambs of God to the slaughter. Don't follow. Don't follow. Jesus said that's the beginning of the end. He says those things are going to happen and you'll see them more and more as we get closer to the end times. What else does he have to say? I'll try to move along. Verse 6. Verse 6 says, and you should hear wars, rumors of war. Be not trouble. These things yet come to pass, but the end is not yet. Man has always been at war. Man has never lived at peace with man since the time of Adam and Eve and their son killed their own other son. So peace between human beings, Jesus, is not going to happen. There's always been wars on the earth somewhere going on and further on. And then he said, now listen to verse 7. Because to me, this is speaking just directly to our age. Verse 7, he said, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Various places, places where they've never been before. Listen to what Jesus said. The mark, a great mark of the nearing of the end times is division among people. Every excuse you can think of to hate somebody, to dislike somebody, Divide yourself away from someone else. Hatred and division, Jesus says, will be a mark of the beginning of the end. But did you know there's been a lot of people over the years who have died in wars? But more than half of the people who have died in wars have died in wars since 1900. Does that tell you anything? Does that tell you that anything is intensifying? In Zechariah, Zechariah spoke in chapter 12 and verse 2. Behold, listen, talk about talking to us in America today. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to all the people round about. 
when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth shall be gathered together against it. Why? I have looked at the television news and thought, why do so many people hate Jewish people? What have the Jewish people done to cause them to hate them so badly and want to kill them and get rid of them, wipe them off the face of the earth? Nothing but live. Nothing but exist. Nothing but wear the name of God. And I'm here to tell you no human being will ever settle that issue until Jesus comes back again. Another sign? Look at verse 7. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes. You know all of these things are happening every day all around us. Natural disasters. Things that cause famines all over the earth. Millions are dying today because of natural disasters and because of, of hatred and wars. But the main reason, the main reason for famine, famine even in our world today is wars. Look at the Russian Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine into a, literally a breadbasket of the world. Ukraine produces so much grain. China depends on Ukraine grain. Europe depends on Ukraine vein, grain. Only the, only the farmers here in America produce more grain per acre than the Ukrainians do. Putin wants to control that. Can you imagine the power he would have if he could control at any moment, say, I'm going to just cut off your grain? And, uh, certainly a nation would be brought to its knees. Imagine. Imagine if you and I were to see him get in control. But look around you. There's more than that. Look at our own wonderful America. Look at how many agricultural acres have been consumed by subdivision and by condominiums and by highways. And then just ask someone who knows and you'll find out that so many American agricultural acres are owned by the Red Army of China, controlled by China. Where are we? Put your ear to the ground and you'll hear. You'll hear the sounding footsteps of God as you hear the earth itself tr trembling from beneath as earthquakes are happening in so many places, up until just about 40 years ago, there had never even been an earthquake in Colorado. But now there's one almost every week. Earthquakes in Alabama, of all places, just two weeks ago. Oh, it wasn't that grand, but it was enough that the shaking of God and planet Earth is saying something to us. He's saying even the earth is nervous and trembling like a woman in travail and pain before childbirth when she's in labor. Even God's earth, even God's earth, no spot on earth is immune. No spot on earth is immune. What is God saying? With every earthquake, with every hurricane, with every tornado that have grown so much in intensity over the last few years, God is saying to America, God is saying to China, God is saying to every human being on earth, wake up, wake up, turn to me now while you have a chance to do so. Turn to me now. All of these things must be, Jesus said. They will come, but they will come in greater intensity as we get nearer. Like when I was a child, I'd tape a piece of string and put a washer on the other end of that string and tape it to a pencil. And I'd just swing it around and it'd go wrap it around that pencil. What did it do when it wrapped around that pencil and it got closer and closer to the center? It got faster and faster. That's what's happening in our world today. These things that Jesus talked about are more intense and more frequent than ever before. 
Look at verse 9 of chapter 24 of Matthew. Then shall they deliver you the afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. In the last hundred years, people have been killed for the cause of Christ and in the name of Christ that in all of the centuries that this earth has lived before. No, we haven't known that in America yet. But in Syria, in the Middle East, in places all around us, Christians are hated and executed. I watched the other day as one of our leaders in Congress stood and said, Hamas is not near the threat to America that Christianity is. You like that? Neither do I. Christians shall be hated like never before, the Bible says. Never before have Christians been executed in the numbers they're being killed today. Thank God. Thank God for giving me a home in Sweet Home, Alabama. But look at those today who march in the streets of Birmingham and Tuscaloosa and other areas of our great state of Alabama, marching in support of Hamas. Monsters, executioners, crazy, evil men who hate every person who is not a Muslim. Satan's strongest attack, though, Satan's strongest attack on the church is beginning to come now from within the church. As Satan is using people to change the way Christians think with his apostolic thinking, apostolic hatred of God, apostasy, liars who say there is no God. But instead they just say sweet little things like it's okay, it's okay to believe what you want to, baby. It's okay. No one has the right to discriminate against you for the lifestyle that you enjoy. It's okay. If you enjoy it, it's all right. Those old folks are crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. Their rules are out of touch. They don't understand. The Bible's okay, but it's got errors in it. And because of that, I pick me out some. And I say, well, that's wrong, and I know that's wrong. Why? Because I just feel like it is. I do my own thing, go my own way, be my own self. And nobody has the right to tell me different. In fact, if I don't think it's sin, then it's not sin to me. Can I tell you something real plain, pure and simple? Don't miss this. If God says it's sin, it's sin no matter what you believe. No matter what you think. No matter what you enjoy. No matter what you like to do. If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. And if God says it's right, it's right. Not dependent on some nine black robed judges or a Congress full of folks. God said it. And if God said it, you better abide by it. Chapter 24, verse 10. And then shall many and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Has there ever been a time Hatred, an offense. Oh, I hear people on, all the time, oh, I was offended by that statement. I didn't like that statement. You made me mad. You hurt my feelings. Big deal. If it's of God, you better listen to it, no matter how it offends you. People are leaving the true church of Christ in droves because they don't like what the preacher's saying or what they don't like that the congregation believes or what's in their bylaws. They're going out here <laughs> and forming their own church, setting up their own set of beliefs and things they want to believe in, and their own pleasure and entertainment and replacing the truth of God with a lie of Satan and teaching others the same. Because why? We can fill the church up. We can fill the church up. That old easy believism. Faith that anything goes. No commitment, just except to one's own self. You have the right. You deserve a break today. You deserve to what you like to do. Don't worry about God. Come on in. 
Do as you please and let God's word be damned. Listen, when it gets hard, and it's going to get hard to be a true, genuine believer in Christ. When it gets hard, when it costs to follow Jesus Christ, when it really means stand up for Jesus, even if it means the death, where are you going to be? How are you going to feel? Listen, I'm telling you, people would destroy the church to fit their own desires and their own pleasures and thinking nothing of it. That's why today the true church of God is being deserted like a bunch of rats on a burning ship. If you stand up for the true things of God, many churches, many pastors today, are denying the very truth of God's word because the deacons say, we're going to fire you if you don't stop preaching about that. Oh, it don't happen in America. It's happening in Pickens County, Alabama. I've watched it. I've seen it. I've heard it. I've seen big crocodile tears come out of the eyes of friends of mine who were pastors because they were told that very thing. If you preach that again... You're gone, sucker. What do you do? Oh, people today, they don't want to hear that Jesus is the only way. There's many ways to heaven. Surely there are. No, there's only Jesus. You'll go by the way of the cross or you won't go at all. The truth, the truth is what's going to matter to you. Preacher, don't preach. Don't, don't preach that kind of thing. Don't preach that lordship of Jesus that I have to submit to what he said is right or wrong, that I can't make up my own set of rules, that I can't sort of do like I want to. I'm sweet and precious. Don't, don't preach about those everlasting fires of hell. Don't preach about that stuff. Don't preach following Christ to the death. It's what a Christian really is committed to. And that's why today... Many churches are full of empty people. Let me tell you something today, and I'll be honest. I'd rather offend every person in the world than to offend my God. People are offended today by the real truth. Verse 11, Jesus said, many false prophets are going to come. Many false prophets shall rise. And they shall deceive many. False prophets abound today. False prophets. These humanists that want you to believe that it's all about the human. It's all about the people. It's all about me. It's all about what I like and what I enjoy. It's not about this God that you want to tell me about. But look at how what, what's followed. And how do we know the evidence of it is clear? Look in verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The word iniquity literally means lawlessness, iniquity, lawlessness, no care for the law, no care for what God is teaching us. Do I have to explain that it is abounding in our country today, in our world today, in our own community today? Lawlessness. We can get away with it. We don't have to do it that way. We can go ahead and do what we want to. The law has got nothing to do with it. The lie of hell, but never before have liberal judges and liberal lawyers controlled the justice system the way they control it today. Never before, never before has our justice system been so false, so worthless. I challenge you today, if you don't think there's lawlessness in America, if you don't think there's lawlessness in Alabama, I challenge you. Tell me one night that you have watched the 10 o'clock news and didn't see somebody in Birmingham and or Tuscaloosa getting shot and killed. Lawlessness shall abound. That's why you lock your doors every night. How many of you really want to go to Birmingham and walk through those streets at night? Or even in Tuscaloosa for that matter, or maybe even reform. I don't. I got better sense than that. Lawlessness abounds. The criminals control the streets. 
in so many places today. It's even dangerous to get in your car and drive down the road. Somebody with road rage is liable to blow you away. False prophets. False prophets have convinced so many of our young people. I, I listen to the garbage that's coming out of our colleges and universities and now permeated into our high schools. Teaching our younger generations that there's no right or wrong. And that this old gray-headed preacher that's preaching to you today is just telling you a bunch of lies that you don't believe it. You go ahead and live some other way. It's not like that at all. Life is just like this video game you play. Just mow them down, shoot them down, and then walk away and laugh about it, and it's okay. Love. Love for humankind has disappeared. And lust has took its place. We've lost the commitment that God requires of a loving relationship. We've decided that somehow little Cupid makes us fall in love and then later on we might fall out of love. It don't work that way. You choose. God tells us very plainly in his word, husbands love your wives. Wives love your own husbands. It's a choice. You choose who you're going to love and who you're not. You can fall into lust all you want to. That can happen anywhere, anytime. It can even happen after you're married to one woman and you lust after another. That happens. But true love, real love, that will take you through a lifetime together is a great, great treasure and gift of God. But you've got to work for it. You've got to earn it. You've got to work for it. Our moral anchor is gone. It's gone. And without Christ, what are we left with? Chaos. Christ or chaos? It's the choices we have. Iniquity abounds, and we're there. Now, you know me. I'll tell you the truth, and then I'll let you leave feeling better about yourself. All right? The last sign. Say hallelujah for the last sign in verse 13. He shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. What is the last sign? The people who love Jesus Christ. They will endure to the end because they are saved and because they know Christ and they love Christ. And they will make it through. They will make it through the times that we're living in today. They will be able to come up here and rest with us. They will be able to be comforted by prayer and by knowing God. And even if it means that, that their heads are cut off and their lives is taken because of their testimony for Christ, they are going to hang in there. And Jesus said, this gospel shall be preached as a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Jesus just told you. All of these other things are going to happen through all of the years, all of the centuries of time. They're going to intensify as the end gets near, but they're going to happen. And just because they're happening doesn't mean that the end is here. It just means that they're what happens. But he says, listen, there is one thing, one thing that has never happened happened before on the face of this earth until now. This gospel, what gospel? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. God says, I'm going to give every nation on the earth a chance to hear of Jesus Christ before I wipe them out. Never before. Never before today has the gospel of Jesus Christ been preached worldwide. But hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God today. Any human being on the face of this earth can listen, can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Either by missionaries worldwide or by media of some sort. I'm so excited. I am. I'm so excited. Oh, I'm not excited about having to suffer if I do. I'm not excited about having to look at someone in the eye and hear them say to me, deny Christ or die. And say, I will not deny Christ no matter what. I'm not excited about that. I'm excited about the fact that I see and I know that whether it be by the rapture or whether it be through the door of death, 
I'm going to see Jesus soon. Could be any day. Hallelujah. Last thing, we better get serious. We've molly around here long enough. We've played with the Bible long enough. We've put God in the, in the closet, on the coffee table, or wherever else we might want to put him through the week, and then go to church on Sunday and everything's okay, and then we go right back to the same old world we living we was doing before. We better get serious today because God is serious and Jesus is serious and he's showing us his seriousness. We need to get serious about living this Christian life. And we need to be telling others about Jesus. Will you stand as our musicians come? I don't know what your need is today, but I know one thing. I know that if you don't need, or if you haven't known Christ to now, you need to know him today. You need to come to Jesus right now. The end is near. The time is coming soon. Please, please get right with Jesus. Thank you.